So without taking more time, let me introduce you to our presenter today, Suzanne Smith. Suzanne? Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today. We've got more and more attendees. I see some old friends on the list and I see some new friends. I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Um, I have to also thank uh, the folks from AHA to uh, allowing me to do this. And I think one of the things I love about them is they've cracked the code, uh, in my opinion, on the issue of poverty. So for those of you who are not familiar with them, um, I hope you become familiar with them because they really are game changers in this space. So a couple of things before we get started. Um, certainly, if you want to engage with me, and I would love that, um, feel free to put your favorite buzzword in the Q&A area, and um, I'll be monitoring those as, as I go along. Hopefully, I've covered all of them. Um, I actually have at the very end some buzzwords I'm not able to get to, so you can learn more about them. Uh, but at the end, we will be taking Q&A. So as we go through this, if you have questions, feel free to uh, let us know about that. We will also be sharing the slides. So if you signed up for this course, we'll be sending you the slides. Um, our firm, Social Impact Architects, is completely open source. So you can use these slides however you wish. In addition, um, many of these uh, definitions we could do a full dissertation on. Uh, and so we have actually put together blogs and we actually write a weekly blog called Social Trend Spotter. And so at the bottom of the page, if you want to learn more, um, you can actually go into that uh, web link and actually find more information. And so on the one you'll be getting, it will be web enabled. So feel free to ask questions. Uh, if you want to learn more, um, feel free to follow through on the blogs. So let's go ahead and get started. So I titled this What's in a Name, um, because obviously the greatest writer of all, Shakespeare, asked that in his famous play, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, and oftentimes I find in the social space, we use these words, um, these buzzwords, and oftentimes don't take the time to come up with common language around what they actually mean. And I think that common language is very important, and it's one of the reasons why I founded Social Impact Architects 10 years ago. I spent over 10 years in the social space and had to spend a whole lot of time and energy figuring out what the other person was trying to say. And even more so, figuring out what actions I needed to take as an organization to make sure that I was keeping up with the latest trends. Um, so our mission is accelerating social change. And one way that we do that is creating clarity. And that clarity is so critical because if we as a social sector are on the same page about what these words mean, then we can be that much more effective. And when we're effective and we're effective together and we're rowing that boat together with that clarity, then we can create momentum together. So our collective goals for the social sector is to create clarity and momentum with everything we do. So let's dive forward and talk through some of the shifts we're seeing uh, that are influencing some of these buzzwords. So first of all, um, we spent quite a bit of time early on in our genesis as social impact architects, really thinking about how things were shifting. And I actually spent a good amount of my career in the 20th century, and I've actually seen some of these shifts for myself. Uh, and so we put together in a blog in 2017 what the shifts were that we were seeing that were carrying us into the 21st century. Uh, and so I encourage you to read that blog more to get additional details, but let's walk through these just quickly at a high level. So when I first started in the space in 1997, we were very mission focused. If we did good, that good was good enough. Now with fast forwarding to the 21st century, with data being the um, currency of our time, with impact being the bottom line, you really do see a, a movement towards impact being the focus. And that focus is so critical for us in the social space. And so when I talk to people about impact, I oftentimes talk about this language that we now are getting ourselves into. So we're using words like social impact. So we'll be unbundling what impact really means and how you can accomplish that in your nonprofit. The next one, and this is certainly for the fundraisers on the call, I also think that one of the big changes we've made is from really a donor model to an investor model. And let me explain what that actually means. A donor is really more interested in a transactional relationship. I'm gonna give you my money and I'm just gonna assume you're doing good with it. Um, and they aren't necessarily interested in kind of that impact or the results driven model we've been talking about. Now we've really moved to an investor focused. And so they may be giving us our money, 
um, to do the mission, but they want to see more. They want to see that money being put into action. And some donors actually want their money uh, to be leveraged you know, through social enterprise and through other things. And so I oftentimes tell my clients, think of them less as a donor and more an investor in your model and continuously communicate to them about how their investment has created impact and results within the social sector. Certainly one of the other changes that I'm seeing and when I started in 1997 with Phoenix House was that we were in the program business. You know, so we saw a, fun, uh, a grant, uh, we saw some fundraising around our programs. Now we're really seeing a lot of nonprofits coming about, particularly with the socially entrepreneurial movement, to really be focused on results. And when I talk about results, I talk about the full continuum. So in addition to programs, we're also looking at advocacy. So making sure there's enough money to serve those that we're serving, but also through collaboration. And we're gonna be talking more about that and talking about collaboration in its broadest sense. The other thing that I always find interesting is that we also have this tendency in the nonprofit space um, to be bootstrapped. And it's one of the things I most admire about the people who serve in the nonprofit space. You know, we quickly are the ones that think about how we can do the most we can to stretch our dollar. Instead, we really want to move towards this idea of sustainability and really looking at return on investment related to every dollar that we're spending. And so it may mean that we have to make different choices for our organization to make sure that we're actually sustainable. So that's another word we're going to be talking about in just a moment is sustainability. So taken together, this actually means that sometimes the nonprofit space can be risk adverse. Um, we oftentimes can't take the big bets that we want to take in order to serve those that we care about. So that really shifts us to this idea of being entrepreneurial and actually moving beyond kind of our traditional charitable model and into kind of more of a socially entrepreneurial way of thinking about the way we do our work. So I'll also be talking a little bit about that. One of the other elements that we've added since 2017 is this idea that we actually are really moving beyond our individual work. Um, and one of the buzzwords of today and that we're writing quite a bit about and presenting across the country about is this idea of collaboration. And we're gonna be getting into that definition as well. And so when I think about collaboration, um, I think about it in terms of the game Mousetrap. Uh, if you were here in person, I'd be asking you, did you actually play this game when you were a kid? But the Mousetrap game was really interesting because it actually changed the whole paradigm around how we thought about board games. Up to that point, they were two-dimensional. Then they moved to this three-dimensional model um, where you actually did create a mousetrap and you were trying to figure out a way to, to not let your mouse be trapped. So using that as a lens, one of the ways in which I think about the future is that mousetrap. So in the past, in the 20th century, we really were up to our own devices. You know, we really were thinking about things at an individual level. So you can see the mice, they're sitting there at their individual areas thinking, where's the cheese? Where's the, um, on the other side? How do I get there, et cetera? And they each have their own maze that they're actually racing. Um, fast forward to today, where we're talking more and more about collaboration. I think over the last two to three decades, we've been talking quite a bit about collaboration. And you can see the mice have come together and they're actually just talking about the maze. You can probably imagine they're trading stories, they're trying to think about how to get to the other side, maybe even talking about whether or not it's even worth it to actually go through the maze. And then we're really moving, I think, and I think this is a trend that we'll be seeing over the next 10 years, into this idea of system change. So how do each individual person, each individual nonprofit, in this case, the the mouse that's standing on the shoulder of the other mouse, how do we collectively come together and stand on each other's shoulders to create system change? Uh, and so you can see that there's a mouse right on the top who's taking notes. And you can imagine that those notes are probably filled with all sorts of shortcuts to the maze, or maybe how they can work together. Or maybe, and if you'll notice, do they even need to go through the maze? What if they go around the maze and go to the other side versus going through the maze? Or maybe, just maybe, do we even need the maze at all? And so when it comes to nonprofits, I think we're really thinking differently about how we get through the maze. And maybe does the, the maze even need to exist, whether it's for us as nonprofits or for our clients? And so I really do see this as being something that's gonna be a big game changer as we move into the next decade 
thinking about how we come together with our government partners, with business and other nonprofits to really create system change. So I'll also be alluding to that a little bit when we talk about our various buzzwords. So let's dive into those buzzwords. That's the reason why you're here today. And like I said, one of our goals over the past 10 years at Social Impact Architects is deconstructing these buzzwords. And one, creating clarity around what the buzzwords mean, but also really creating action steps. So really fixed uh, ways that you can actually put those buzzwords into action within your organization. So you don't necessarily have to hire a consultant and they really are step-by-step -step processes that you can follow. So first, this one that I think probably is the most predominant one in our space, sustainability. So I hear this from funders, I hear this from nonprofits, I hear this from board members. I want my nonprofit to be sustainable. I want more of our nonprofits to be sustainable. And to me, the formula behind sustainability is being a high performance organization as well as a high impact organization. Think back to uh, your individual uh, community. You probably can self-identify organizations who are incredibly high performance, so they create great social change, um, but they also are well run. You know, they have great leadership, clear goals, they're a learning organization, and they have those diverse financials that we're all looking for. But you may also have those high impact nonprofits, those ones that are scrappy and just get a lot done and directly connect with the people that are, they're serving. And so really our goal is to be both. We want you to be high performance, um, but we also want you to be high impact. And so we're gonna break that down and really talk about what does that actually mean? So when we do a strategic plan with an organization, we look at it through this lens. And this lens has evolved over the last 10 years as times have changed. And so we look at it from an impact perspective. We also look at it from all the other areas around the circle. And I have to say, when we talk about board games, I oftentimes think that the job of a CEO as well as the job of a board is kind of like a whack-a-mole uh, job. You remember that game for when you went to an arcade where you constantly were trying to attack the mole and you move from one to the other to the other, and you don't ever really feel like you're accomplishing anything. And I think that's true when it comes to sustainability. And part of a strategic planning process or part of any type of process that actually creates action for your organization, it's not about focus on it any one, but focusing on how they're synergistic together. So that's one of the reasons why we developed this model is showing how they all come together. So if you have high impact, then people are gonna start talking about you, but you also have to have strong messaging to make sure they know the impact that you're actually having. And if you have impact and you actually have a strong brand, then you actually increase your revenue. In fact, I argue if you have strong impact and you're messaging that out to the community, you most likely don't have to worry about revenue because the results speak for themselves. And if you have all of those things and the revenues coming in, then you can create a high performance organization. And through that high performance organization, you can attract the talent and the culture that makes you unstoppable as an organization, both talent in the people that you actually hire, as well as the board members that you actually attract. So it creates this virtuous circle that starts first with impact and then talks through and works through brand, revenue and operations. And culture and governance is really the glue that holds things together. In fact, I'm a big fan of Peter Drucker, for those of you who know me. And one of the things that I love that Peter Drucker said is culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so certainly you want to create a good strategy, but truthfully, the biggest, biggest driver of success for an organization is its culture. And certainly that comes from both the staff as well as the board. So those are the different areas we look at. The other way in which I would think about sustainability is where you are on the life cycle. So I wouldn't compare a startup with a mature organization and, and neither should funders as well. So when you think about the organizational life cycle, it really gives you a lens into how you should be thinking about your organization. And so you see on the horizontal, you see each of the different stages, including decline and crisis. And those are areas that you should be paying attention to. And in the rows, and particularly the first row, you can see we've actually put the sustainability areas in here. And you can see over time what actually happens to the organization. And sometimes that time doesn't matter. It could be that you make an intentional decision that you stay in startup for the foreseeable future, that you want to be volunteer run and you want to be kind of grassroots oriented. And that's perfectly fine. 
It's really about making that intentional decision about where you want to be in the life cycle. So if you want a good take home exercise with your board or with your executive team or even your staff, I'd encourage you to individually chart where you are. So on impact, are you in startup? Or are you in growth? And actually, if you want to cheat a little bit, you can put yourself in between. And then compare your notes with other members of the board or other members of the executive team and see if you share where you are. And if you happen to be not solidly in one column, you're likely experiencing what we call growing pains, which essentially means that anytime you're too far in one category and not far enough in another category, you oftentimes create what's called growing pains. So part of our goal through strategy is to try to make your solidly in one category. And so I definitely encourage that you actually do that exercise and really find out where your organization is. And as you go through strategic planning or action planning for your organization, you try to line up into a particular column as much as possible. Certainly, if you want to learn more about this, um, our blog on nonprofit growing planes, as well as the one on decline, will be very helpful as you kind of continue to think about yourself through this lens of sustainability. Next, um, we talk about vision, mission, and values. And it used to be when I first started in the nonprofit space, we only talked about mission. So if you'll remember our juxtaposition between 20th century and 21st century, that's all we talked about. Now we've added vision and we've also added values. And I love the fact that we've actually added these. To me, vision is really where we wanna go. What result do we wanna create as a result of our work? And values really gets to the heart of our culture and making sure that we have the accelerator, which for the nonprofit space can only really be our talent, uh, to actually put towards our mission. So we affectionately call this the Holy Trinity, um, vision, mission, and values. And taken together, this is your foundation for your sustainability. So vision is your desired future state. And remember, you shouldn't mention your organization when you actually look at a vision statement. It should be a grander goal that you, and you not alone, actually are creating. So for example, end homelessness. That's a great vision for all of us together to try to end homelessness or to reverse climate change. That's a vision that's very aspirational for all of us on the globe. That should be your vision statement. Then your mission statement is your unique contribution to that vision. You have something that you're doing very uniquely. And certainly you wanna to get to something called a unique value proposition to get there, which we'll get to in just a couple of minutes. So the best mission statements are short, memorable, action-oriented, and something that will hopefully inspire someone to, to want to learn more about your organization. So those are my tips related to vision and mission. Then when it comes to values, these are all things that are specific to your organization. And we have a great blog on values where you can actually walk through how to create values for your own organization. So I encourage you to check it out. This is actually one of my favorites and probably one of the ones that actually gets the most misunderstood. So impact. Um, you, if many of you know me, you know that I often say impact is the bottom line of the social sector. So impact is a really interesting word that we've really added to our lexicon in the last 10 years. It's come through a lot of work that we've done through social, as social entrepreneurs, but also as data becomes more and more important. In fact, I always love the quote, in God we trust, in all else bring data. That's really true. We really need to bring data to the conversation. So let me just walk you through what would be a typical logic model. So you would have your inputs, you would have your activities, then your outputs, and then you get to your outcomes, what resulted. So let me give you an example. So let's say I'm running a high school prep program and I'm prepping people to go to college and I'm really trying hard to get them to go to college. So if I were to say that 90% of the people that were in my program went to college, would you say, is that good or is that bad? So most people, when I ask this question in a live presentation say, oh, that's really good. But what if I told you that the high school that I'm actually located in, 85% of the people in that high school actually go on to college. Well, again, it may not be good, it may not be bad, it really depends. And so then I have to dive even deeper and say, okay, uh, if 85% of the people in the high school go to college, what is my target population? Well, let's say 
then I'm working with that delta, the 15% that don't go to college. And of that 15%, I'm 90% successful. Well, then you'd say, oh yeah, that person is having impact. We also have a good example here um, for a community college too. So essentially with any outcome, you really have to look at the relative difference between that outcome and what would have happened anyway. And that is the definition of impact. What would have happened anyway? So basically what resulted less what would have happened anyway, that equals impact. So that delta is your impact. So when you think about impact, you really are thinking about it in terms of how do you get there? And so that delta is really what people are looking for right now when they're talking about impact investing or they're talking about social impact. And so that's really the crux of what we're trying to look for now with any nonprofit is not just what outcomes are you creating, but actually what impact did you actually create? And this really came about as a result of social enterprise. Um, and one of the things that makes me very excited, and some of you may have seen my article in Chronicle Philanthropy yesterday about this, is that we really are seeing a meeting in the middle. You see these purely commercial organizations getting together, so Fortune 500 CEOs, as well as conscious capitalists saying, you know what, in addition to creating shareholder value, so making sure we get money into our retirements, we also want to make sure that we create social change. And so they're moving to the middle and they're saying, OK, we want to be a force for good as well. And that's really a great movement in the direction of everybody trying to create social change. Then we also see nonprofits or what I call purely philanthropic organizations also moving to the middle. So you see people who are actually saying, let's try to create market conditions. Let's have a balance between mission and market to try, to try to create social change. This came about as a result of recognizing that just our charitable dollars alone cannot fund all the social change that we need to have. So if we harness the marketplace as much as possible, whether it's through a for-profit who actually uses all of their talent and all their energy to create social change, or it's leveraging nonprofits and finding ways that they create social enterprises so that they can use the profits from those social enterprises as engines for social change, then that is what we're talking about when we're talking about social enterprise. So if you had a Girl Scout cookie lately, or you have gone to the Y to go to the gym, or you've gone to Salvation Army recently and gone to their thrift shop, you have actually been a consumer of social enterprise. And so we see more and more nonprofits, not just the large nonprofits, the national nonprofits starting social enterprises, these hybrid organizations. And that really gets to this idea of innovation. So that's another buzzword I keep hearing about, innovation this, innovation that. And you know, I'm really excited about that. I think it's great when we're trying to think differently um, and we're trying to change the game. Remember what I sh showed you that mousetrap, part of what we're trying to do with that maze is actually trying to create social change and saying, does that maze even need to exist? So you're seeing innovation both inside and outside the social space to try to create social change. So you oftentimes hear the words social innovation, social entrepreneurship, and social enterprise used interchangeably. Uh, and really it's under this larger umbrella of social change. But I wanted to get to the heart of how they're alike and different. So social innovation is always about the idea. And it isn't necessarily a new idea. Um, my personal viewpoint is there really isn't any new idea. And that part of our goal in the social space isn't to create new, but it's actually to leapfrog existing ideas and make them better. And so we'll talk a little bit about a model that you can use in the next slide to do that. But the goal of social innovation, as always, is to really look at existing issues. So that maze in the case of the, of the mice, and say, is that really how we wanna do it? Or do we wanna do it differently? Social entrepreneurship on the, on the uh, flip side is actually about mindset. It's one of the reasons why ac across camp, uh, college campuses, the social entrepreneurship is being taught. It's really a mindset much like entrepreneurship where um, social entrepreneurs are forces for change. And there's a number of different ways in which you're a social entrepreneur. So there's a litmus test and a discipline that is involved in being a social entrepreneur. If you wanna read more about that, I've got a number of blogs about what makes a social entrepreneur uh, in Social Trendspotter. And then the last is social enterprise, which is really about the business model. 
And we talked a little bit about that business model. So again, if you've eaten the cookies or you've gone to the gyms, you know what a business model looks like. And so it's a, re a way to actually create social change using your organization. So social innovation is about the idea, social entrepreneurship is about the mindset, and social enterprise is about the business model. So I mentioned innovation, and one of the things that I'm a big believer in is kind of really thinking through how we can think about innovation in its broadest sense. Um, and one of the models I best, I most like, whether you're trying to innovate from the start or you have to kind of rethink a particular program, maybe it's losing relevancy, maybe it's losing impact, is a concept called Lean Startup. So we've taken the concept of Lean Startup from the for-profit space and really worked to try to figure out how do we customize it to the social sector. So I'll just briefly walk through it. And then, as I said, there's a blog where you can actually walk through it in much more detail. The first thing is really to isolate the problem. So Lean Startup is very connected to this idea that the most important thing you can actually do before you jump to a solution is really best understand the problem. In fact, I oftentimes don't tell my students that they shouldn't fall in love with the solution, they should fall in love with the problem. Because the solution might change as the problem actually change, changes. And so you really wanna isolate what the actual problem is. One way to do that is through design thinking. Another way to do that is through some research and design to make sure you really understand what's at the root cause of any given problem. The next is to identify goals, target population, and outcomes. So you wanna develop a hypothesis of what it is you're trying to create. So what would your potential goals be? Who would you potentially be serving? What are the outcomes you're hoping to get? Then, once you have a pretty solid idea of what the problem is and is a hypothesis of what your goals as well as strategy might be, always search for best practices. Best practices should be the number one thing you try to get out of this presentation. There are so many good, thoughtful people have, who've already put research and evaluation into many of the best practices. It's one of the reasons why I love AHA is they have not only done their research, but now they're bringing that research to the masses. And so the extent that you can find best practices and then customize them into your organization, you'll be one step ahead when it comes to impact. Then you have to research existing programs in the community. None of us wanna duplicate efforts. We wanna make sure we really are leapfrogging what exists in our existing community. So if it already exists in your community, that oftentimes gives you opportunity for collaboration it oftentimes gives you an opportunity for conversation about how we potentially could be doing this better. Then you always have to look at your internal capacity to see once you connect the dots between the problem, the goals, the best practices, as well as existing programs, can you actually do it? Is it viable and is it feasible? I'll be really honest with you, only about 20% of ideas are actually viable. And so going through this process, it's okay that you say no go that it's not something you pursue. I think no is one of the most important things you can do both individually as well as professionally, saying no. Um, and then of course, if you find out that it's gonna work and it actually, you know, that 20% of the time, then you can design the most impactful complementary program for your community and start talking about it. We found that if you follow a lean startup process, you're 80% more likely to actually be successful. So I definitely encourage it through grant process. I also encourage it when you're not just starting something up, but you've actually seen a program potentially not making the impact that it used to make. So it sometimes helps to start all over again. And so Lean Startup can be used for startup, but I also say it also can be used when you need to reimagine a program. So a program is no longer relevant or it's no longer creating the impact uh, that it once did. So we mentioned unique value propositions. So we've shifted through the sustainability puzzle. We've talked about impact. Now we're talking about brands. Um, so unique value proposition is one of my favorite things to teach. Um, if many of you have read the book, Good to Great um, by Jim Collins, he actually talks about unique value proposition in a, in a very specific way. And so one of the things that we wanna think about when we think about unique value proposition is the value that you're creating. And this gets to the heart of your mission as well as your competitive advantage. So you need to be thinking about three things and bringing those together to develop your unique value proposition. What your customer needs and cares about. So oftentimes customers need things, but they may not care about them. So just because you build it, people might not come. So you've got to make sure that you have something 
that is not only a solution that creates a solution to the problem, but is also something that the target market actually really needs. Um, in addition to that, you have to think about what you do really well. You know, we want to we want to stay away from things like mission creep, where you're doing things that maybe your clients need, but you may not be best positioned to actually provide them. There may be a nonprofit down the street that could do five times as well, or maybe gets grant funding to actually provide that service. Then you also want to think about what your competition does really well. And in the nonprofit space, we want to be different than the for-profit space. So the sweet spot or the unique value proposition is that black center. In the nonprofit space, it's actually the um, space, the purple space right above. Because in theory, if your competition is doing something really well, we don't want to do it in the nonprofit space. We want to make sure we're collaborating with that organization in order to do those things. In order to reduce duplication in the space and help manage the finite resources that we actually have, we really want to make sure we're in that spot where we collaborate with competition, not necessarily compete with them. It really helps you, your venture, your organization, differentiate yourself. And the more unique you are, and the better you can actually use that uniqueness to create a clear and convincing and concise statement, the more likely your voice will be heard. You mentioned competition a couple of different times, and I want to talk about my version of competition. Oftentimes, people think about direct competitors when it comes to competition. And you can see there's also on this slide indirect competitors and distant competitors. And we have a blog on competition as well. But one of the best ways in which I talk about competition is through a story. When I went to the Fuqua School of Business, there was this legendary story um, that was shared from marketing class to marketing class. And it happened when Dave Thomas, the founder of Wendy's, the burger chain, came to Fuqua. He was actually a big benefactor of the business school. When he came to the business school, he actually always sat down with uh, students and actually had just a direct conversation about what it was like to run one of the biggest companies uh, and one of the biggest burger chains in the country. And he always, every single time, asked this question of these very intrepid whipper, whippersnapper MBAs. He said, who is my competition? And you can imagine that, of course, they were like, well, this is an easy question. It's Burger King. It's McDonald's. And he always said no. My biggest competition is people eating at home. And so I'm always struck by that answer because it means sometimes the direct competition isn't the early childhood center that also does what you do. It's people not using early childhood at all and not recognizing the value of early childhood. So in my opinion, the biggest competition that we have in the social sector is people doing nothing. People not seeking treatment when they need, when they need it as addicts people not recognizing the value of after school uh, or social enterprise. And so when we think about competitors, I want you to think about it as broadly as you possibly can. That really, while the direct competitors are, in theory, our competition, but our biggest competition in the social space is people doing nothing. And that includes donors, by the way. We've got two customers. Not only is it our clients or our art patrons, but it's also um, our donors and the people who are our competition there as well. So we've got we've got both customers that we're trying to make make sense of. Collaboration is the next one. So I mentioned this and I alluded to it earlier when we were looking at the mouse maze and how the mice were going to be getting through it. And certainly collaboration is critically important for our space. And I want more and more collaboration happening. But what I oftentimes find is people don't really know how to collaborate. We have some instincts around collaboration, but oftentimes we don't know the actions behind collaboration and what makes collaboration more or less successful. So I came up with a definition that really goes to the heart of this specific question. So the definition is two or more organizations working together in a meaningful, well-defined and deliberate manner by investing time, energy and resources to accomplish a set of shared objectives, notice that shared objectives, that are mutually beneficial, again, going back to value creation, to advancing the missions of the organizations involved, and that are more likely to be achieved together than alone. So this means that when you're collaborating, you have to be careful about thinking about not only the value that you're creating, but also the value that you're actually extending. So you should be creating a multiplier effect anytime you're doing collaboration. So I oftentimes say it's a multiplier effect. 
So you have to really think about if there are four people in your collaboration, you've almost got to re recreate eight times the results associated with it. So it should be at least two times the results you could have gotten alone in order for the collaboration to be worth the time and effort. One of the ways I also talk about collaboration is about the idea that not all collaboration is equal. And so I've got this great continuum that we put together and perfected over time um, and actually was started by the Center for Nonprofit Management here in Dallas uh, and we built on. And you can see there's all sorts of different types of collaboration. So I'd encourage you when you use collaboration to also think about it in the terms of what kind of collaboration you actually have. When we come to a collaborative project, this is one of the first slides we put in front of people and actually ask them what type of collaboration you actually are. And interestingly enough, oftentimes people in the same collaboration will circle different things. And so we don't have time to go over this in detail, but we'll be sending this slide to you. But you can see at each level, you're getting more and more of a formal process and you're getting more and more connection to the other person, moving from common focus to a common business model, which oftentimes gets into merger and acquisitions conversations. All of those fall under the umbrella of collaboration. So if you have collaborations, I would encourage you to take a look at those collaborations and see which one you fall under and making sure you're clearly defining what you're agreeing upon by being part of that collaboration. Uh, one of my favorites as we continue to go around the circle is governance. Um, I get a lot of questions about board governance and what good governance is. Now keep in mind, even though I talk about governance in terms of the board, there's also a really important role that the executive team has when it comes to governance. Um, I look at it through a lot of different lenses, and you can see we want people to be accountable and efficient. We want things to be consensus oriented. We want it to be participatory. When I think about good governance, a couple of things that I think about. First, a good board gets together for meetings, and they're actually accomplishing things through meetings. A great board is doing things between meetings. And so you can think about this in terms of board engagement. So boards are supposed to be there to really represent the interests of the community and to really make sure that the nonprofit is accountable to its mission. So if things are only happening in meetings, they're really just good. If you really wanna to go to the great level, you really wanna think about what's happening between meetings. Are there being ambassadors for organizations? When they're going over that, when they're getting into that proverbial elevator, are they giving the pitch about the nonprofit? Are they leveraging the resources of their company in order to benefit the cause? What are they actually doing to make a big difference um, in the organization? So good governance is very participatory. It's very inclusive. So there's a lot that goes into being a nonprofit board member. So when I think about governance, I'm really looking at the overall governance of the organization, making sure you're following your bylaws and following the letter of the law, but also making sure you're making informed, thoughtful decisions that are in the best interest of the community as well. Culture. So we've talked a lot about culture and the fact that Peter Drector thinks that culture is actually even more important than strategy. Uh, culture is one of those things that has recently come about in the last decade where we've spent a lot of time talking about culture because we see organizations like Google and other tech companies bringing culture into um, the, the limelight. In my uh, home state of Texas, we actually have an airline, Southwest Airlines, who decide, has really said that culture is the thing that differentiates it from every other airline. And I can say, as somebody who lives in that community, it is absolutely true. Um, their reason for success is really about culture. And when we talk about culture, it's important for us to think about what does culture actually mean? And it comes from a Latin word that actually means to cultivate. And I think that's important because culture exists whether you actually pay attention to it or not. And I love Deborah Thorson's uh, quote here, and I'll read it, that culture is an energy force that becomes woven through the thinking, behavior, and identity of those within the group. The other big mistake that oftentimes people make is they think culture is top down. We actually believe culture is side to side. Um, and actually, it's one of the things that can be influenced from the bottom up. And so some of the visible artifacts of culture really relate to dress code, titles, relationships, all the things that you can see, but there's also invisible values. We oftentimes refer to this as the iceberg effect, the things you see below the surface that sometimes we don't talk about, the rules of behavior, the philosophies, the rules, the attitudes, all the rituals. If you want to learn about culture in your organization, I would encourage you to ask your last employee that you've hired. 
they oftentimes will have the best reference point because they haven't yet drunk the proverbial Kool-Aid and they actually maybe will know how the culture is different from their other organization. So you should ask them, you know, what is the culture of our organization and how does it compare to the culture you were, you were last in? Because then you can really see how you're alike or different and then you can really create a culture that is unstoppable. As I referenced, we have a great exercise, a do-it-yourself exercise on creating values, and values is a piece of culture. Um, many people feel like values are enough for a culture, and you can put them up on the wall, you can put them up on your website, but truly as culture is something you live out. Um, and when you walk into an organization, you can feel that culture. Um, I want you to think about the last time you walked into Walmart versus Target as an example. How does Walmart feel? from a culture perspective versus how does Target feel from in terms of perspective uh, or any other um, organization that you visit, you can kind of get a sense of what that culture is. So it's certainly something important to know about your organization, but it's also important as a key tool for us in the social sector to really leverage not only to attract talent, but to retain talent over time. All right, well, we're at the end of the presentation, um, but I wanted just to reference that we do have a weekly blog called Social Trend Spotter, which you're welcome to sign up to. But there were a whole lot of buzzwords that we couldn't get to, like strategic planning, and I mentioned the values one, storytelling, dashboards, crisis management, elevator pitch, uh, and risk management. And so if you want to, you're welcome to go to those blogs to, to learn more about those in particular. Um, so I actually wanted to spend the last couple of minutes answering questions. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes before folks need to get off the phone. And I'm just going to see if we have any questions here. Um, and we do. Uh, so uh, we have Phyllis, um, who's from Indianapolis, from the St. Vincent de Paul Society. And I don't think she has a question. She was just telling us that she was here. So that's great. So right now, feel free, if you have uh, questions of any kind, please feel free to send them to me uh, through the chat function uh, or the question function. Suzanne, this is Ruth, as we're waiting yeah. for questions to come through. Perfect. How do you start shifting your board? How do you start shifting your organization? So, um, one of my favorite ways to actually shift a board is first just by understanding where you are relative to others. Um, so one of my favorite sources is BoardSource. If you're not signed up on BoardSource, you certainly should. Um, they have various levels of membership, um, but BoardSource does a great survey. We do a great survey um, and we're happy to share that with you to just get a sense of where your, your board is relative to their knowledge of their duties, but also how they're executing on key areas of their board um, service. So how are meetings being run? Are they doing a good job related to succession planning? I find that that is a key leverage point for a lot of boards. Um, so once you've gone through orientation with your boards and once you've actually given them kind of a lay of the land, oftentimes at retreats, I will uh, work with the board to see where they are relative to other boards and really just shore up individual areas that they may need to work on. Um, some of the top three things that I see in boards that I work on, one is the board committees are typically inactive or they're not being put to good use. My personal belief is that board meetings should not be about updates. Um, when you're getting a bunch of um, high influence people together at a board meeting, it should be about strategic questions. Um, and more of the time should be them kind of helping to problem solve with the organization or talking about ways in which um, they can better govern the organization. So it could be professional development. It could also be top questions that the organization is grappling with. It shouldn't be a bunch of updates. So most of the, the work of a board should be done through committees. And so oftentimes I find that committees have oftentimes have gone without charters, have not gone without a committee chair that is really meeting regularly and taking on key strategic issues from the strategic plan to really work on. So committees is one way that I think you can um, jumpstart your board. The other area is really related to board composition. So we have spent a lot of time in this space with DEI, so diversity and inclusion goals, um, really getting to the heart of equity. And so board composition is incredibly important for our sector. We have to make sure that boards are actually um, not only responsive to the community, but represent the community that they're serving. 
And so oftentimes I will spend time with them on the full continuum. How do you recruit the right board members, making sure your board is composed um, of the community, then how do you retain them? I oftentimes find that in the first three months, if you haven't captured the attention of a new board member, then they're probably gonna be lackluster the rest of the time. So one of the things I recommend is a buddy. So assigning that new board member a buddy so that they can actually uh, get to know the organization more quickly. Um, getting them to volunteer early on is also another way to get them engaged and involved. Uh, the third thing that I spend time with a lot of boards on is actually the meetings themselves and how do they want to interact as a group. Um, one of my um, findings from the research that we've done is most board members join because of the mission, but they stay and are engaged because they find the board work enjoyable, which means they enjoy the staff, they enjoy the other board members, and they found a way to uniquely contribute to the mission, not just come to board meetings. And so it's really up to the board governance committee, as well as the board chair, as well as the CEO and the executive director to really make sure engagement is a big piece of what they're doing through um, the board meetings, as well as retreats. So typically those are the three things I see that the most work needs to be done on relative to boards. Um, so those are some areas just to jumpstart your board a little bit is one just to give them a relative analysis of where they are as a board in comparison to other organizations um, and also as a group be able to kind of express their concerns or um, excitement about various topics and then turn that into a board retreat where you can actually have a hands-on experience where you work on each of those issues. All right, um, so I have a, another question here um, about culture. Um, oh, actually, here's a great one. Um, so I have a question about what sample titles would you suggest for social entrepreneurs inside community-based organizations? Uh, so I very briefly refer referenced the idea of social entrepreneurship. Um, for those of you who know my bio, um, essentially I was an entrepreneur before I was an entrepreneur. And um, I actually was um, very involved with a number of initiatives with the American Heart Association and Phoenix House. And so I'm a big believer in social entrepreneurship. In fact, I think we, we teach too much in our colleges that starting a business or starting a nonprofit is the way to go. Um, I would much prefer that, that talent for a variety of reasons comes into the nonprofit space, working for existing uh, organizations first before they become an entrepreneur. And so typically you see the titles of those people being um, director of innovation, director of special projects, um, something along those lines. And even beyond the title, um, and I know that's what your question was, I would encourage you to think more broadly and think about what the job description is. Um, because oftentimes when you bring those people in, they can tend to be countercultural. Um, they typically are not doing a charitable program that they're running a social enterprise. And so I remember at the Heart Association, when I was uh, working on the issue of childhood obesity, there were a number of other staff members who would look at what I was doing and saying, why do the rules not apply to Suzanne? Because she's doing something socially innovative. And one of the classic examples um, is that it used to take about a month for you to get something posted on the American Heart Association website. And so staff would insert, you know, here's the, here's the week I needed, or I need to get in the lineup. Well, I got to jump the line because the stuff we were doing was innovative and obviously created a lot of buzz around different things. Well, we were working with former President Clinton and couldn't wait a month to actually put something in on our website. So I think the other thing I would just encourage in addition to the title is really having a good conversation with your staff and that's all staff of why this position is so important and why they may have to have different rules associated with that kind of a position. Um, and they may actually um, need different, different oversight um, from the board um, to really think through how to do something innovatively. Um, particularly when you're in startup phase, you oftentimes need more time and attention. Uh, so I definitely encourage the title, but I would also encourage a job description as well as kind of a, um, a cultural understanding of how social enterprise or social entrepreneurship may need to be treated differently initially within the organization. All right, so um, I am looking at the other questions here. Um, 
Will the slides be available? Yes, we're going to send those out. If you signed up, um, we'll get the list and we'll make sure these get to you as soon as possible. Um, we have a great question here on culture. If you are brand new to an organization and the culture is extremely different from the cul culture that you came from, how do you go about trying to fix that? Um, and so this is always a very interesting question because I oftentimes think people are paralyzed when they think about culture because if they're not the CEO or they're not the board, they feel like they can't really make a difference. Um, I was actually recently counseling someone I work with on this very question. And I know it's frustrating um, and I've been there. You know, I've spent more time in the nonprofit space than I've actually spent as a consultant. But my advice is that um, one, to spend really 90 days to get to know the organization. Um, I think it's oftentimes when you're innovative or you are um, open to new ideas, you know, you'll come into an organization like a bull in a china closet. And I think that's unwise for a number of reasons. Um, so I would encourage you to really come into the organization really at a 90 day period and think of yourself like a consultant, like you're going to learn all about that organization without necessarily going to judgment. Um, because it could be that a culture is a certain way for a very specific reason that may not be apparent. And so after that 90 day period where you've built trust, you have learned a lot, and then you can make an informed decision about whether or not the culture needs to shift, you can then have conversations. And hopefully that organization, if they have a great talent management process, should be checking in with you at that 90 day period and say, how are things going? What have you noticed that you like? What do you notice or that you don't like? What are some barriers in the job? And I would encourage you, rather than doing this off the cuff, I would really come back and say, you know, ask some questions of the organization and say, you know what, I'm noticing that this is happening, but I, this is what you want to have happen. Do you understand why there's a difference? You know, or I'm noticing that the culture is this way, um, but I've read this article that says that actually cultures are moving in this other direction. What do you think about that? Um, so rather than accusational kind of thoughts, and I'm not saying that you would have done this anyway, but rather than statements, I would actually recast them as questions um, and use your research, you know, use best practices and say, you know, most youth serving organizations are now doing this or most poverty relief organizations aren't using the word poverty anymore. And maybe we should stop using that word, particularly when it comes to uh, our clients. You know, whatever, whatever it is that you're really trying to solve for is to think, think through that. And so um, if the culture continues to persist, um, I oftentimes encourage people, particularly if they're new in their career or it's a new job, to not worry about the entire organization and start to actually just change the culture of the stuff that you can control. So if you're managing a department, you can have a very different culture than the culture of the entire organization. And you can put your ideas into practice. Um, and so I did this at the Heart Association um, very successfully. You know, I saw some things that I thought should be different. The, the area that I worked within, I tried hard to kind of create a very different mindset and over time, that mindset started to have ripple effects into the rest of the organization. And so I would encourage you to, to act on the things you can control, and then hopefully through osmosis, those things will start happening within the rest of the organization. So it's, it's, it's uh, one of those questions that's hard to answer, but uh, if you want to directly connect with me, um, my contact information is on the next slide, and so um, I'll bring that up. Uh, Maybe maybe the, the folks uh, have taken away the usage for me to do that, but um, just I'll press it again. Uh, I there we go. Uh, so my contact information is there. My email is right there. Feel free to email me directly, and I'm happy to have a phone conversation about your specific situation. I think that is our last question. Um, Ruth, are you seeing anything different on your end? No, I think we're all good. You have anything, Leonard, Leonard, to finish us up? Thanks, Suzanne. It was great stuff today. We appreciate your time. And thanks to everybody for attending today's webinar. And I just want to let you know that we do offer these webinars the first and third Thursday of each month. And if you want to learn more about the AHA process and its family of solutions, go to ahaprocess.com. Again, thanks, everybody, for attending today's webinar. And until next time, have a great day.